Martha Collins is a poet, and her most recent book of poetry is Admit One, an American scrapbook. It begins with 1904 World Fair addressing racism, eugenics, immigration, and other related issues through documentary materials and lyrical explorations. Martha has also published seven earlier collections, including Day Unto Day, White Papers, and a book-length poem, Blue Front, as well as four volumes of co-translated Vietnamese poetry. Martha has won numerous awards for her work, including an Annisfield Wolf Award, uh, the Lawrence Goldstein Poetry Prize, two Ohio Anna Awards, and a number of fellowships, including NEA, Bunting Institute, Witter Biner Foundation, and Ingram Merrill Foundation. She's the founder of the Creative Writing Program at UMass Boston, and she has served as Pauline Delaney, Delaney Professor of Creating, Creative Writing at Oberlin College for 10 years, and she is currently editor-at-large for Field Magazine. She is here today to share with us some of the work in her latest book, and I would like to invite you to please give a warm welcome to Martha Collins. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you all for being here. As Cheryl said, I'm going to be reading from a very new book, which is very nearly a book-length poem. I didn't intend for it to be that, but one thing just sort of led to another. The focus throughout is the scientific racism of the early 20th century, particularly the eugenics movement. It begins, as Cheryl said, in the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, which I knew that my, parent, my grandparents from Southern Illinois had attended. I knew that there were fake marble palaces extolling the virtues of civilization, but then I found out that there were also 3,000 human exhibits at that fair to show the contrast between civilized and primitive peoples. And then I found out that one of those exhibits had ended up as an exhibit in the Bronx Zoo two years later. So the first two sections of the book are called Fair and Zoo. I'm not going to read from those today, but I'm going to move on from there because then I discovered that the founder of the Brock Zoo, a man named Madison Grant, had published a book in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race. And by the great race, he didn't just mean the white race, he meant the Nordic white race, um, a very special part of the white race. The book and the author both became central to the movement that became known as the eugenics movement, uh, which had a number of facets. One was the propagation of the fit race, uh, the right people who should indeed propagate their kind. Um, but on the other hand, the unfit should uh, not, and that led to sterilization and segregation of unfit peoples. There were also anti-miscegenation laws and movements to prevent the, um, the marriage and propagation between the races. And finally, there was a very strong anti-immigration aspect to the eugenics movement. That's what I'm going to focus on today, partly because it is so much in our news, and I think it's important to know some of this history. Um, I'm going to read from first uh, the 1916 section when this book by Madison Grant was published, and then I'll read from a 1924 section which culminated in uh, very strong anti-immigration laws which uh, were with us for several decades and which also influenced what happened in the 1930s when Jews, among others, were not allowed into this country. Um, there is a great deal of documentary material in the book, which I will indicate whenever I'm quoting like this uh, to indicate that I didn't write these things. And I should say that some of these things are quite disturbing. Where They Lived, Ducoin, Illinois, 1916. My mother and father were 12. She went to the Baptist church. He went to the Christian. They went to the ward school. They lived on one side of the railroad tracks, 
On the other side lived Negroes who went to a Negro church and school, and Irish, German, Polish, French who went mostly to the Catholic. My mother's father was German, my father's mother Swiss German and Irish. They thought the Irish English. But they themselves were not immigrants who lived on the other side. Madison Grant, part two. As anthropologists said, there were three or four, the white, the yellow, the red or black. But there were three within the white, Nordic, Alpine, Mediterranean. Not a new idea, but Grant popularized Nordic, the term, and added race to eugenics, which was already leading to segregation and sterilization of the unfit for the passing, see race suicide, the passing of the great, the Nordic, the strong, the virile, the tall, the blonde, the passing of the great race, Scribner's 1916. Race, race. Stock, strain, family, line, breed, blood, skin, shape, of the head, of the pack, animal, human, judge. Better, fitter, swiftly to find, foot, horse, car, Run for your life around town, the block, the camp. To the top, the finish, contend, compete, in, for, against the other, the not so great, not even in the. Alien, part one. If you were Chinese, you had mostly been excluded since 1882. If you were Japanese, things were complex after 1907-08. If you were anything else, you were not excluded as such in 1916. Although there were many who thought you should be, if you were the Eastern or Southern European that you increasingly were, Russian, Polish, Jewish, Italian, Polish, Slavic, Greek. And you could have been excluded as a convict, lunatic, beggar, pauper, polygamist, anarchist, prostitute, epileptic, Cron contract laborer, mental defective, bearer of loathsome, contagious disease, a growing list. If you came after 1892, you probably, 90%, arrived on Ellis Island, where in 1906 you were still likely, 99%, to be admitted. But where, if you came in 1914, you might have been given an intelligence test by Henry Goddard, the results of which were inconclusive and your chances of being excluded small. But in 1916, you might, 10%, have been marked X, mental defect. If you came in 1917, the new Immigration Act could have excluded you for 33 reasons, and for the first time would have done so if you could not pass a literacy test, test for which Madison Grant had lobbied, or if you came from an extensive Asiatic barred <coughs> zone. If you were admitted, you might have taken a train from New York to Southern Illinois or you probably would have worked in a mine, especially if you were Italian. Fitter families. 
Yea, I have a goodly heritage. My mother said, her sister said, the Bible said, and it does, and they did, we do, but. That was also the motto of fitter families for future firesides. Contests featured at state fairs using anthropometric measurements, medical, dental, vision exams, intelligence tests, personality evaluations of families, some with several generations, as well as eugenic family histories. The forms had a blank for race, which could be Nordic. And charts were posted with literacy rates for native-born, foreign-born Negroes, as well as birth rates for native-born alien. There were also displays with flashing lights. This light flashes every 15 seconds. Every 15 seconds, $100 of your money goes for the care of persons with bad heredity, such as the insane, feeble-minded criminals and other defectives. And medals awarded to winners, which read, Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Fit, fit. Healthy, hardy, worthy, made to fight, explore, rule, a good, fit for a, fit the facts to be, fit as befitting. Undiseased, defective, dragging down might have a right here in the yard to be tied so can't have more of them select. Fit into a square, a round of weeping, anger, and starts to be stopped before they throw a poor, poor, and if the shoe now 1924. What they were doing, what they did. Ducoin, Illinois, 1924. My mother and father were 20. She was teaching second grade in the all-white John B. Ward School. He was working in Jones Drugstore and joining had joined, would briefly join, the Ku Klux Klan, which was appearing that year in local churches with gifts and recommendations. Her father was cited for contempt of court for criticizing in his newspaper the release of a white man and a Negro woman convicted of a brazen violation of the laws and of common decency. He reported the citation in the headline story and accepted responsibility the same day the paper announced that the president had signed into law the new immigration bill. Madison Grant, part three. After the passing of the great race, which was cited by scholars, ministers, politicians, the Ku Klux Klan, and Margaret Sanger, which influenced, among others, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Lothrop Stoddard, The Rising Tide of Color, 1920, which appeared in four editions, the last and largest in 1921, all edited and commended by Maxwell Perkins. After the passing of the great race, Madison Grant presided over, co-founded, co-directed most of the major eugenics organizations. Created, inspired, was essential to immigration reform, including the 1924 Immigration Restriction Act. Conceived, achieved Virginia's 1924 Racial Integrity Act and devised an ingenious plan to save the redwoods, 
which were threatened with extinction, like the great race. After the passing of the great race, which was published in Germany in 1925, Adolf Hitler, who owned a copy, wrote, according to another eugenicist, a letter to Madison Grant that said, the book is my Bible. Pass, pass, pass. Through, over, across the river, gate, way to the other side, world, onto one's issue, the torch, the next. Slip away of paper, a test, into or onto, or into a law, or off oneself as something other than what, because one couldn't. Came to such a by on the other side, or over, fallen, all under, standing, without, not in, not from, not on. Alien, part three. Then Madison Grant met with Congressman Albert Johnson to devise a formula for the 1924 Immigration Act, which was based on the census of 1890, when there were fewer immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe, thus reducing to 12% the influx of Jews, Italians, etc., from a pre-World War annual million to, as it turned out, 20,000. Seven eugenicists testified, including Harry Laughlin, who in 200 pages of testimony cited analyzed army IQ tests with Nordics on top, Jews on the bottom, and said the formula would favor Nordics over non-essential members of the community. Grant, too ill to testify, wrote that the scientific and just formula would keep out lower types who could displace Native Americans, and wrote an article targeting immigrants as criminal, insane, while the Saturday Evening Post and New York Times argued for passage. Suddenly, said an I suddenly said a, an opposing congressman, a new word made its way into the English language, Nordic, Nordic, everywhere you turned. But the eugenicists lobbied Congress members, bombarding them with letters, telegrams, telephone calls, and after a long debate on a clause excluding the Japanese, which led a Japanese publicist to predict eventual collision on the Pacific. The bill passed. And this is the last poem. Once we were. Once we were immigrants, given to thought we were, given the right to be, taking what wasn't our making what wasn't who wasn't us were. Take, take, take off your shoes, your taken from shoes, your take down shoes, your shoes on the table, your take. Table the conversation, the talk, the top of the table, steeple, sky, for just a minute be quiet, listen, the shifting crumbs on the table. Shiftless, we said, the shifty eyes gave them away. We didn't see the less than dress, a shift, a slip, as in under another shaft. Shaft to have to hold an arrow 
handle for hammer, column to build a shaft of light, our enlightened missile. We own the whole mine. We own the, the shaft. Mine, we could not stop the baby mine. We would not stop ourselves. Mine it, drill it, strip it right down to hear us making, taking over, taken out. Stop for a listen. For once we were maybe our getting forgotten, a shifting to taken, mistaken, to get set for the coming all hands on the table. Thank you. In 2005, after hurricanes battered Louisiana, I believed the best way I could combat racism involved sheetrock and good intentions. With other white volunteers, I slept on a church floor in the steamy southern heat. On that first trip, we worked in the seventh ward where the houses seemed to be holding their breath. In our shotgun, shotgun house, the walls sagged. Yellowed ceiling plaster scattered across the floor like a giant's jigsaw puzzle. Despite a new roof, rain still sluiced in. We strapped on paper masks and goggles. Atop a ladder, I tugged on damp boards till they dropped into a heap along with nesting material of who knows what animal. From cabinets and corners, we pulled grimy, slimy material and hauled endless armfuls. My t-shirt stuck to my back and belly, soaked with sweat and the stench of decay. Our homeowner unfolded aluminum lawn chairs outside for our protection, she said. Miss Cynthia, let's call her, was an elderly woman with skin the color of cocoa syrup. As long as we work, worked, she perched there Daughters and grandchildren milled around, wearing baggy, low-riding pants or dresses with matching heels and a different wig each day. I felt bland and pale. Much of Miss Cynthia's family remained in shelters in other states. Unscrupulous contractors, like the one who fixed her roof, had exhausted her savings. In order to bring her grandsons home, she needed finished rooms. Hopefully, she chose paint colors. She began to hug us, saying, I prayed for help, and then y'all came. Her faith was both touching and upsetting. We tried not to be stymied by the enormity of her need. We stretched work days later. In the tired evenings, we attended racism dialogues in which outraged black residents railed against cruel police, ongoing federal neglect, and racist indifference of white Americans. Through Miss Cynthia, we felt the painful stories more personally. Exhausted from working and caring, we sat and absorbed the rage, but we didn't like being told we were racist. Eventually, neighbors appeared, mostly in threadbare clothes. They talked about their scattered families. No one had received insurance, lacking the proper paperwork. Recovery grants based on home values meant that the predominantly black neighborhoods received vastly insufficient repair funds. Coloring each story were two themes, an aching wish for families to return home and profound anger at their country's apparent abandonment. Even more than sweat, frequent tears clouded our goggles. When we left, Miss Cynthia's house was newly walled and primed. A burgundy front door gleamed. In New Orleans, we learned about damage and discouragement, and we learned about repair. So we go back. Each trip, we've worked on behalf of another black family. I'm embarrassed to say we avoided the racism workshops. We white people convinced ourselves we already understood the point, and our energy was better spent rebuilding. Underneath, this white person hated the feelings the workshops engendered, resistance, helplessness, guilt. Since then, every story about roadblocks to recovery and NOLA's unique racial history has taught me to be more humble about what I know. At the same time, recent deaths of black Americans have shocked many whites, forcing us awake to longstanding racist policies and practices. Rebuilding homes is important work, but I don't have a clue how to build an entirely different foundation. 
chastens, chastened, we've returned to the racism dialogues. Now I'm learning about our shared legacy and my own racism. Now, 10 years after the flood, I know how to hang sheetrock, but I'm still learning to stay open-minded. I keep stumbling toward understanding, hope I can, hoping I can contribute to the enormous repairs needed. We won't run out of houses to repair or lessons to learn anytime soon. My heart is heavy for the mamas who will lay down to sleep in the stark silence of night instead of to the rhythm of rocket dreams expelled in tiny whispered breaths. My arms ache tender for the mamas who stripped of their loved ones no longer feel the holy weight of heaven turned flesh against their breast. My words, they are undone for these weeping mothers. And we stand united, our bodies, the concave of sanctuary make for our weary kind. We bend our heads in shared grief, pouring love onto the battered, grasping hands to bear the weight of it all. Rest your head against me, Sister Eve. Let me crouch low to cup your face. No, Eve, we will not forsake you, for we are one and we are all broken. <laughs>